Good afternoon from Ottawa and uh, welcome to African Scholars Initiative AASI Graduate Studies in Canada webinar. My name is Professor Gideon Christian and uh, I'm an assistant professor of artificial intelligence and law at the University of Calgary Faculty of Law. I'm also the president of uh, African Scholars Initiative and uh, African Scholars Initiative, it's uh, a registered not-for-profit corporation that aims to attract uh, bright scholars of African descent to pursue graduate studies or graduate education in Canada. Our webinar today is going to focus on PhD admission in Canada. And uh, we'll be providing information about um, PhD admission and studies in Canada. I have with me today a very rich panel, a panel of award-winning current PhD students in various Canadian universities who will be joining me in this webinar to discuss about their graduate uh, uh, admission or their PhD admission process in Canada, as well as their PhD studies in Canada. So thank you very much for taking your time from different parts of the world to join us in this graduate study webinar. And uh, without wasting much time, I would like to uh, invite our panels to introduce themselves. So we have three uh, panels today. We have Yolanda Orsondo, Jake uh, Efodo, and um, Chi Nonye Ude Chuku. So why don't we start with you, Yolanda? Can you please introduce yourself to the participants? Hello everyone, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, my name is Yolanda Osondo and I'm a, I'm a third year um, PhD candidate in the Department of History at the University of Calgary. And um, I end my bachelor's and my master's degree in um, history at the University of Lagos in Nigeria. Um, my present research um, deals with women, gender studies, legal history, history of crime and the justice system. And basically my research just works on um, the interaction between women and the justice system in colonial Nigeria to the early um, post-colonial period. In Canada, I'm a recipient of a, a couple of scholarships. I, and, oh, I received the Chancellor Northford Scholarship in, in um, 2018. And presently, or oh, I'm also a two-time recipient of the Alberta Graduate Excellence Scholarship. Uh, thank you very much, Chinonye. Uh, sorry, thank you very much, uh, Yolanda, for the introduction. So we also have another member of the panel, uh, Chinonye. Please, can you introduce yourself? Okay, I think... Uh, can you unmute yourself? Oh, perfect. I was trying to do that, but I, see, I saw that you could control that from your own end. Okay. Okay. All right, so good afternoon, everyone from here. I am in Ottawa. I am Chinonye Dechuku, currently a PhD student in neuroscience at the University of Ottawa. And in my second year just began in September, to, um, September 2019. Um, just for a brief background, I had my, because I'm from Nigeria, <laughs> and then I had my bachelor's degree at the University of Nigeria in Suka. I did chemistry there from 2018 up until, sorry, 2008 up until 2012. And then I moved to Canada in 2015 for my master's in May at Dalhousie University. And there I studied food biochemistry. And afterwards I worked for some time and then I moved to Ottawa for my PhD last year in September. My research explores the uh, capacity of dietary interventions to reduce the risk for depression and anxiety, generally mental illnesses. Just a um, brief background as well. So prenatal stress and, mo and mostly, so, oh yeah, prenatal stress is, you know, stress your moms, <laughs> I'm just kind of, kind of trying to, you know, um, translate this to humans, but stress, let's say um, a woman experiences during pregnancy. 
And that such stress, especially when it's chronic, has been linked to um, deficits in brain development. And that would now precipitate mental illnesses like depression and anxiety later in life. So what my research is doing is to see if the diet that the moms are eating during pregnancy could modulate the effect of prenatal stress. So to see if those diets could reduce the impacts on brain development and also if that could impact the offspring risk for mental illnesses. So that's what we're looking at. And um, what else? To, what, what other pointers do I have to um, introduce myself? I think that's everything, but like if you have some other um, you know, questions or specific um, information that you want to know about me, then for sure I'll be open to share. But thank you so much for inviting me here to this webinar, and I hope that the insights that we offer here would help all of you in your, you know, in pursuing your grad studies and as well as getting scholarships in Canada. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Chinonye. You also forgot to mention that you are a Venian scholar and one of our newest Venian scholar. So, okay. So um, we also have another member of the panel, and that is the person of Jake Okechuku Efodo. Jake, can you introduce yourself? Uh, Jake, are you there? Sorry, we're having a... Okay, let me try. Yes, I'm here, Prof. Sorry, <laughs> okay. I That's fine. I was trying to that, unmute yeah. myself. I was trying to do that, but I figured, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jake Okechuku Efodu. Um, apologies, I'm going to turn on my camera in about one minute when I get into my apartment. So yes, I'm Jake Okechuku Efodu, Nigerian as well. I am a, P uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the Osgood Hall Law School at York University here in Canada. Um, so thank you very much, Prof, for organizing this uh, very important webinar and to help other people who need to come study here know what they need to do and how they can get here with all the information that we can provide. In terms of my background, I am a legal practitioner. I was born in Nigeria, grew up in Nigeria, studied mostly in Nigeria. Um, I did my LLB, my undergraduate law degree at the University of Abuja. After that, I went to the Nigerian Law School and then after law school, um, did some work for a while, did a master's in the UK and then went back to Nigeria. Then after a while, I was like, okay, I want to advance my grad studies in Canada. And so I did come here for a master's degree and afterwards, uh, I, I got into the PhD program from my master's program as well. Um, yes, I am holding the Vanier Scholarship. It's the most prestigious graduate scholarship in Canada because it awards students with 50,000 Canadian dollars for as much as three years. Um, so I'm a current holder of that, uh, you know, of that scholarship. I also have a few scholarships uh, from a couple of other places as well. But um, so yeah, that's it. My research, my research borders on something similar to what Prof is doing, but at a much higher level, at a much lower level than what Prof is doing. <laughs> I'm looking at the impact or the, the impact of artificial intelligence uh, on human rights. Particularly, I'm looking at how AI is legitimized in Anglophone Africa and how that can be used to improve the status of human rights um, across the region. So that's pretty much what, what my research um, is looking at. And I look forward to this very, uh, very promising webinar. And thank you so much again, Prof, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, for joining us from wherever you are. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to seeing your face very soon uh, on, on Zoom. So, and, um, so, um, we are going to meet all participants and except for, of course, the panel. And we have to do this because of previous experiences we have from our webinar where we had a Zoom bombing uh, incident. So we don't want that to happen again. So that for that reason, we're going to be muting all the participants. Uh, please feel free in the course of uh, the discussion with the panel to type whatever question you have on the chat box. 
uh, we have someone who is looking after the chat box who is probably going to be reading that question uh, questions you have there for the panel to you know to answer now i see a question there already talking about having the contact of uh, the panel members definitely you're going to have that i can assure you every member of this panel is on LinkedIn. So you can easily do a search of their name on LinkedIn to connect with them, but we'll be providing you with further contact details either uh, by subsequent email or during the course of the uh, panel discussion. So now let's now go to our question for our panel. And the first question I would like to uh, start with is, I would like to know, um, of course the participants would like to know, why did you choose to pursue your graduate education in Canada? Uh, Yolanda, let's start with you. Um, so I lectured for a few years in Nigeria and I always knew that I was going to pursue a career path in the academia. Um, I had my first and second degrees in the same university and I was thinking about um, getting, going to a different school and experiencing um, university education in a different area. And so um, the two main things that I think let me, I always thought about going to either the US or Canada, but two main things um, made me decide on Canada. One, um, after a lot of research, I realized that I didn't have to write GRE exams and I didn't have to write any English exams for my costs, like my cost of study. And so that was going to cut down on the financial cost of um, any application I had to submit. And then the second thing was, I was also searching for an environment that was very welcoming to international students, both during um, your studies and even after. Uh, that's a very good point, uh, uh, Yolanda. An environment that's very welcoming to international students. And I can assure you, Canada is one of such environments. The immigration system in Canada is designed in such a way that international students can transition from international students at the completion of their study to um, so at the completion of your study, you have like three years work permit, which gives you enough time to transition to permanent residence and subsequently a citizenship. So that's one attractive feature of education in Canada. So let's go over now to uh, Chinonye. Your own case, uh, what was the attraction to Canada? Um, I think I may have to unmute you again. Can you? Can you try? Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm unmuted now. All right. So my story or my journey to Canada is quite um, unconventional, <laughs> but um, I mean, like most people would want to pursue grad studies in Canada, like you know they had that intentions and then they followed on that. But in my own case, it's quite different. So. What happened was when I finished my bachelor's degree at the University of Nigeria and Sukkot, like I said, at the chemistry department, that was in 2012. And then of course I went for my one year mandatory youth service. And then while I was you know, pursuing um, other you know, opportunities, but mostly job, job opportunities, I got a message on my birthday, which was September 10th. Um, 2014, that I was recommended for grad studies in Canada at Dalhousie University, you know, on full scholarship and all of that. So uh, at first, uh, my parents, they were like, this has to be a scam, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because I never applied for any grad studies. I never applied for any scholarship, nothing, like not even in Nigeria, let alone abroad. So they were like, this has to be scam. But uh, however, the message came from a reputable professor in my department. So I felt like if it was coming from him, then there's probably some sort of you know, integrity and truth in this. So, but then they asked me to come over to the school for elaboration and which I did. And when I got there, I wasn't kidnapped or anything. <laughs> and you know, they elaborated and then they said, yeah, there was this opportunity in Canada. They got to know through a professor here. And then, you know, the person threw out the opportunity and was like, find us a very good, bright student, you know, all of those um, requirements. And then they, that was how I was selected in my department, right? 
So, and um, just so you know, like it's not tied to, uh, I'm not required to return to Nigeria or something like this is just like, yeah, just go, you know, this is full scholarship, everything for you. You don't have to come back, you know, like no allegiance, right? To the department or something like that. So, but although this story, like I said, it's quite unconventional, but you, there are some underlying message or lessons here. And that, and that is um, first hard work because that was something that they pointed out. One of the things that they based their selection. I wasn't the best graduating student in my department at the time. However, they, they like you know, there were just a lot of things that they considered hard work, uh, morals, just a lot of things. But that that just goes to say that whatever you're doing, someone else is watching, right? So. Um, like it's more like the attitude um, part of it. So, and then also when I came to Canada, I did my master's, I could have decided to go back to Nigeria, but Canada, um, like Prof Christian said, it's, you know, it's a land of great opportunities. When I came here, I didn't realize, or even when I was coming, I didn't realize the, the you know, limitless opportunities that I could get here. But then when I came, I was like, wow, this is, you know, so many doors open to me. Now I have to jump in and explore. So I did my master's and then I decided to pursue my PhD studies. So that's, that's my story to Canada. <laughs> well, that's a very interesting story. Now, if I may ask all the panelists to please uh, uh, don't mute because um, the okay. Zoom is programmed to mute all participants so we may have a problem whereby we'll have to continue to unmute you so i will ask you to leave your uh, your line on mute i mean unmuted uh so um let's go to okay chuku who is finally here in person okay chuku tell us what was the attraction to canada uh, okay all right thank you so much um the attraction to me, I mean, to be honest, very honest with you, I was just looking to leave Nigeria. So I was looking for the opportunity that I could find. Um, and so there wasn't anything specific about Canada that attracted me, but I would mention three things that made me choose Canada. One was the fact that when I compared the UK, the US and Canada, um, Canada was the one country that did not only, that did not limit my opportunities post-grad, but, but actually even encourages, uh, you know, graduate students to, you know, file to become permanent residents or to become citizens. In the UK and the US, I have friends who, after their academic studies, they either struggled or they had to go back immediately when they were done. But for Canada, um, there's actually a specific stream for grad students who want to become permanent residents or to become citizens. And I thought that was quite attractive. Secondly, I also had a couple of friends who were studying here. And so their experience too motivated me and they encouraged me to also apply. Um, but to be honest, I knew that I wanted to do uh, my PhD, but I knew I wanted to do it out of Nigeria. And so I was like, if I get an opportunity in Canada, I definitely you know, would go for that. So that's exactly what motivated me. But I didn't have anything, I didn't know anything about Canada. I knew it was cold. I, you know, I couldn't even pronounce the name of some of the cities in Canada when I was applying. <laughs> in fact, my, all, my, my law school is called Osgood Hall Law School. <laughs> I was calling it Osogode. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and yeah, so I was completely oblivious. If Did I, you have a problem pronouncing Saskatchewan too? <laughs> yeah, I trust me, that one till now, I still can't pronounce. So I didn't have anything unique, but being here has been super, super rewarding. Um, I, I think I couldn't have chosen a better country to come do my grad studies. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Okechiku. So what we're actually trying to say here is whether you are, you're coming to Canada by choice or by chance, like uh, Chinonye, um, the fact is that uh, Canada, it's a land of great opportunity, especially if you're coming here to the academic stream, there are a great deal of opportunities here. So, and um, in terms of your ability to settle down subsequently after your studies, you can smoothly transition to that. You don't have to start thinking, okay, what next after study do I have to, what do I have to do in order to not to go back to Nigeria? 
you can only go back to Nigeria if you want to, not because the system does not provide you with opportunities or avenue to remain here. So that's one good thing about, you know, higher ed, I mean, uh, uh, graduate education in Canada. Now, the second question I would like to throw to members of the panel is this, and this is a question I often get both from friends and from strangers on social media and LinkedIn. And uh, you have people who already have their master's education in Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, or wherever they are in Africa. They always ask me this question. Uh, since I have a master's degree already back home, should I just apply for a PhD or should I apply for a master, another master's degree in Canada before proceeding to a PhD? Now, what do you guys have to say about this? And I would like to start with you, uh, Yolanda. I know your own case, you have your undergrad and uh, of course your uh, master's from University of Lagos, a, I mean, a very, a very prestigious school. And uh, I know that because I went to that school. So you finish your master's in Unilag and then apply directly to the PhD program in Canada. So what do you say about this question? So um, I'll begin with the fact that research in Nigeria and the research in Canada is quite different. But um, personally, during my master's, I had a very good supervisor, Professor Olufunke Adeboye. Like she took her time with me. Um, she showed genuine interest. She read through like everything I submitted to her. She always read through everything and left very good comments. So she actually grilled me through um, learning how to research very well. And so it wasn't so, so difficult to transition when I moved to Canada. And I would say if you had like a really good supervisor and somebody who like genuinely showed you that interest and you learned how to really research well, then it's okay to apply directly for a PhD. But if you were in a position where you practically supervised yourself, then you might think about maybe applying for a master's and then before transitioning to a PhD. Uh, thank you, Yolanda. Uh, Chinonye, what do you say? Um, so I'm gonna pick up on um, from where she, where Yolanda said. So it's like for some persons I say, why don't you apply, you know, straight to um, for a PhD program? Why? You don't have to like, so it's good to transition. It's good to have that transition, let's say the master's program, then you know, into a PhD program. But at the same time, I've had some persons who I guess I was probably able to coach them into um, transitioning from their master's in Nigeria to PhD here in Canada. I think it's just about assessing the opportunity that you have before you. So let's say if you have this great PhD opportunity, like some persons that I know, then why not? If you can do the research, if if you you know from your super, like the potential supervisor, like if they are already seeming invested in you, then why not? Like just go for go straight for the PhD. It's all like you're gonna learn on the go. You know, even for the masters, it's still gonna be a learning experience just as a PhD. So, but if you feel you need that transitioning, then absolutely do that. But then again, you just have to assess what you have before you. Uh, thank you very much, Chinonye. Now, uh, okay, Chihu, I'll come to you, and I specifically choose to come to you last for this reason, because in your own case, you already have a master's, not just in Nigeria, but in UK. I think that was in Oxford or Cambridge. Oxford. So, yeah, in Oxford. But you choose to come to Canada, not to do a PhD directly, but rather to go through the master's program before going to the PhD. So why did you choose that part as opposed to just going straight or directly to the PhD stream? Thank you, Prof. The point you make is very valid. Um, whilst there's a difference between academics in Nigeria and other parts of the world, there's a difference between the academic experience in the UK versus that in Canada. People just think because it's both abroad, then you know it's the same, but it's very different, right? But that wasn't really, I didn't know much about the difference. That wasn't really my motivation. Um, the reason why I chose to do a master's instead of going for a PhD directly um, was twofold. One was, one was actually, actually quite personal. I did not know if I would like Canada. I didn't know if I would like the academic experience. So I said, if I come and do one year master's, pata pata, I would just force myself after one year, I would go back to Nigeria. 
rather than do a PhD and after one year, I'm still stuck because a PhD is four or five or, you know, how many years it can go. So I thought the safest bet was to do a master's. If it works out or I like it, then I can continue with the PhD. But if I don't like it, I could just brace up, do one year and return. The second reason is because I chose to do a master's because many schools, including my school, they have a, a procedure whereby during the master's program, you can apply to transition. Meaning that by the time you're done with your master's and you enter the PhD, you will not be starting PhD as a fresher. So you would get to advance, it's called advancement. You get to advance, meaning that you can expand your master's research into a PhD. So I thought, ah, I'm really not going to lose much. If I do a master's and I like it or I do well, they can actually advance me into a PhD without needing to apply afresh. And I thought that was quite a good idea. Um, from last year to this year, 14 of my friends have come to Canada from Nigeria to do PhDs. Nine of them didn't have masters. Nine of them didn't have masters. So they came straight from their masters in Nigeria. Eight of them came and did masters here, maybe because they're doing it in a different field or they wanted to you know, engage on what it meant or what it means to do research in Canada, which is quite different from what we know it to be like in other parts of the world. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it was just three reasons. One was I was scared. I don't know if I would like the cold. I don't know if I would be okay being alone here. I didn't even know if I would survive it. Second was um, because my school had an opportunity for you to transition from a master's to a PhD. And the third was I, which is like in hindsight, I recognize that it's a, it's a bit different. Not that I could not have done it directly into a PhD, but I like the fact that I, I wasn't stressed. I already took my master's time to learn the way Canada, how they do research here in Canada, or how they do grad studies here. So by the time I got into my PhD, you know, it became like a really, like it became really easier for me. Um, and I see that Samuel asked a question about transitioning from BSc straight to PhD. I don't know, Prof would have a better answer for that. But uh, in my school, uh, York University, it's, it's, it's an exclusive preserve for people who make first class. If you don't make first class, I don't think you can double promote yourself from BSc to PhD. I think you should do a master's before that. But hey, thanks, Prof. OK, uh, thank you, OK, Chico. So uh, for the questions, uh, we have uh, Marion Lowell, who is on the background uh, looking after the questions. So when we finish the panel discussion, Marion will uh, then present some of the questions for the members of the, uh, for the panelists to discuss. So please go ahead with the questions uh, in the chat box. Someone is looking after that after them. Now, another point, an important point I would like to add to what the panel have said, you know, there's no hard and fast rule as to whether uh, you should just go to, when you have your master's, you should just go to the PhD straight or whether you should come here and uh, do a master's first. I think you just have to make that decision yourself, taking a uh, lot of factors into consideration, some of which the panelists have uh, highlighted. But another thing I also want you to take into consideration here is, uh, in terms of uh, transitioning to permanent residence, uh, when you've completed your master's here, it gives you additional points for you to be able to, uh, uh, to get invitation to apply for permanent residence. The Canadian had a, um, uh, um, education point. So what some people normally do when they come, do the permanent, I mean, the master's program, then they work, apply for permanent residence, on the process of uh, applying for their permanent residence, they cannot, they cannot go into the PhD program. That's also another way to look at it. In the case of the PhD program, it's a four-year program. In most cases, sometimes more than that. So look at your research skill. How competent are you in terms of research? If you're fortunate to have you know, a research supervisor in Nigeria like Yolanda, who has been able to groom you to be able to conduct research, why not go give PhD? I mean, a stretch short. If you are having some doubt in terms of your ability, I would strongly suggest that you go with the master's stream first, use that to build that capacity, develop that, you know, that competence and that conviction before moving ahead to the PhD uh, 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 program. So, and um, another question, uh, so another question I want us to look at, now let's now go to the application process. Now, having decided you want to do a PhD here, um, what pre-application process should you start considering? Uh, Yolanda, why don't we go with you on that? So someone has to say, okay, we want to do the PhD. So what will be the starting point? 
Um, um, I think the first thing you should think about is, I personally had like a very tiny book. I did not have, I did not have very good internet source when I was back home in Nigeria. I was very limited. So I had a book where I, anytime I had the opportunity to go to the cyber cafe or to, I had very good internet network, I would check a list of all the names of schools I want to apply to. Write down the list of all the professors I think would be, I'll be able to work with. And so that was like the first thing I did. That was like the basis of um, the first thing I did. And then after that, I sent out emails to these professors explaining who I am and what I plan, like what my research was about, what I plan to do and everything. And I received replies from a few and I also had some people who did not reply me at all. So um, another thing was going to school in, in Canada, you have one year before you apply and when you start school. So it's also very important that you also realize that you have a very short period of time to have all your, like to gather all your documents and submit. So before you start all of this, make sure you have um, requested for your transcript, which in Nigeria, when ASU is on strike or maybe non-academic people are on strike, you might not be able to get your transcript and it's very, very important. And then um, I think another important thing is you must also have like a research topic. I think I should have started from there. You should have a research topic. You cannot apply to grad school without having something you plan to focus or direct all your research ideas towards. Okay, uh, thanks, Elena. So we'll come to the research topic. So from the important thing from what you've said now is you know transcript. And transcript is a big problem for uh, for students in some African countries, Nigeria being uniquely one, getting a transcript is a problem. So start making arrangements for your transcript in time. And uh, fortunately, in African Scholars uh, Initiative, we're, you know, we're kind of getting, I mean, this is just a new initiative. We're kind of, uh, you know, building on our structures. But one of the things we intend to do, which I have uh, outlined in our previous webinar, is the fact that when we start our fellowship program, and we've selected our fellows, we are trying to put in place a structure whereby they student, rather than applying for one transcript and sending it to just one, I mean, rather than applying for different transcripts to different Canadian schools, they apply for one transcript, send it to ASI in Canada, then we notarize the transcript and send it out to the various schools they intend to apply in Canada. So if you're applying to three different schools in Canada, rather than going to pay money for three different transcripts, which some, in some cases, I mean, I've had cases of students paying up to $200 for just one transcript. So instead of getting applying to three different, applying for three different transcripts to three different schools, apply for one transcript, send it to ASI, we obtain the original copy, notarize it here, and send the notarized copies to the different schools. So that's one arrangement we have in place. We've not really put that structure in place, but we're looking at that. So getting a transcript is important, and also references, people that will give you reference. That's also another important thing to look at. Now let's talk about references. Who should be your reference? What do you guys think? Should I, if my, uh, my uncle is uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, and he hasn't even read anything I've written before, should I approach him because he's the Chief Justice or Minister of Justice in Nigeria or Minister of Justice in Ghana and tell him to give me transcript? I mean, sorry, give me reference later. What do you think about that? Anybody want to take that? Um, yeah, I can. And um, specifically, I've had some persons who, who are applying for grad studies or even scholarships, and then they're asking me for, you know, to be their references, right? And then some people thought that I was probably being mean by not, by not accepting to do that for them. But here is the thing, your reference, like, your references should be someone who knows you well, okay? Somebody who knows in terms of your, in terms of applying for grad studies, someone who knows your academic capabilities, someone who knows your research capabilities, okay? You want someone who can write you a good letter and getting a good letter is in your best interest. You don't want someone who will just have to write whatever or probably lack something tangible in the letter. So the person should be able to demonstrate instances where you have sort of applied certain skills or where you have you know delivered some some great words so it has to be for instance for phds 
look at someone, your master supervisor should be your number one reference, um, re reference. And then if you have some sort of, let's say, um, I don't know how it is in Nigeria, but if you have some, let's say, committee members, you know, a, a master's advisory committee, those people, like, if you have a good relationship with them and then if you know that they can speak in your favor and then they can speak um, great volumes about your academic and research capabilities, of course, you should include them as your references. Then also, it could be your instructor, maybe someone, you know, you took a cross with and then the person knows you really well. The bottom line is someone who can write compelling letter for you, okay? Not just someone who writes, she's hardworking, he's dedicated, she's diligent, she's that. You need someone who has concrete examples. And for that person to have concrete examples, that means you, have, you must have had a working relationship with that person. So those are the people you should turn to when you're asking for references. Please do not ask your cousin or your classmates to write you ref references, because I get that a lot. It's uh, not thank you. OK, thank you very much, Chile. That's a very good point. So the fact that you are, <clears throat> your, your friend or your uncle is a senator or member of parliament or high ranking government officer in your country, don't go asking them for reference. It will not help you. The best reference is reference from somebody that has assessed you in academic capacity, your lecturers, your professors, your supervisors. I mean, I have seen cases of strangers sending me messages on LinkedIn asking me to prepare to, to if I can write trans, I mean, um, reference letters for them. These are people I don't even know other than the fact that we're connected in LinkedIn. I mean, I remember one example, like I have to tell the guy that, look, what am I even going to say in the reference letter? I don't know you. I've never read any of your work. Uh, what this guy did was not to send me a link of the work he has written for me to read it in order to prepare a reference letter for him. I told him, no, that's not how it's done. Go back and ask your professors, your teachers, or your lecturers to prepare reference letter. So please, reference letter is very important. And that reference letter should cite concrete examples of your skills, your abilities to undertake a PhD or graduate education. That is what the committee, admission committee will be looking for. Not uh, you know, a letter coming from a very high or prominent person that knows nothing about your research capacity or your capacity to undertake a graduate education. Now let's go to another important point, which in this case is the research proposals. What tips do you uh, do you have for prospective uh, students drafting their PhD research, uh, I mean, uh, research proposals? Who wants to start? Jake, do we, can you take that? I'll have to unmute you again. Can you try unmuting now? Sorry okay. about that. So, um... First of all, I recognize that not all programs require a research proposal, um, but for law, most law programs would need you to have a research proposal. And I remember when I was applying for mine, I didn't know what a research proposal was. I'd never drafted one before. I didn't know what it, what it entailed. So what I did was I asked a couple of people who were doing PhD programs, could you send me a research proposal at, when you applied? I, or you could check online, you could like just Google online research proposals for law, and then you would find it. But in terms of, and it, I, I think a lot of people force, a, force around how the research proposal should look like. I think when I submitted my research proposal, it was a very terrible one. I don't think the school was looking for like a fantastic research area. They just wanted to see that you had an idea that you could work with, right? Um, so I can't even share that research proposal now because it's like an embarrassment. <laughs> but there were certain things that the research proposal had. Number one, it had a topic and it's a, like a researchable topic, not just something that is fancy or you know, nice, but something that is researchable, especially within the field of law, right? Um, the second thing was it showed that I'd done some research in the area. So there's a part that you would call like a literature review which is like two or three paragraphs, just to say, this person wrote on this, that person wrote on that, this person wrote on this, but this is what I'm trying to investigate with my work. Um, and then also a paragraph in terms of the methods. Most people just say, oh, I'm going to do 
qualitative and quantitative, not necessarily knowing what it means. <laughs> so um, just mentioning that this research would involve maybe the study of desktop, like a desktop study of materials and stuff, or it would involve field research, or even writing that, you know, I hope to engage in these areas of, like I engage to use these methods, but I, I'm willing to see how, how it would expand during the course of my studies. But generally, a uh, research proposal should have a good topic, um, a little summation of what your research question would be like. Um, and then, you know, some literature review, then something about the methods that you would use. So for my application, when I was coming to Canada, I was looking at how the ECOWAS court, the Economic Community of West African States, how has the ECOWAS court advanced environmental justice and human rights? So I said, when it comes to the ECOWAS, there's this guy called Ebrobra who wrote on this, there's this person who did that, who wrote on that. But me, I'm just looking at how they've been able to advance socioeconomic justice within Nigeria. In terms of methods, I said, I'm not going to do field work because it was a master's uh, thesis. I'm actually going to do desktop study, but these are the kinds of ways that I would do my methodology and stuff. But for PhDs, um, I know not everyone needs to do a research proposal, but I always say, always ask for drafts. My school, for example, they have documents they can even share with you. Um, to guide your writing, right? The most important thing is when you look at a website for a PhD program, they always would specify how they want their proposal to look like. Number of words, what key things you need to look at. I find that a lot of applicants just miss out on the very basic things that the website provides. When you should literally take very keen detail as to what they need you to do. Um, so yeah, um, that's, that's, that's part of what it is uh, in terms of the research proposal. Uh, thanks, Okechiku. Uh, Yolanda, do you have anything to add to what Okechiku has just uh, highlighted? Yeah, so in my own case, I didn't have to submit a research proposal. I just had to submit a statement of intent, which was basically a 1,000 word um, essay explaining my motivation to pursue a PhD degree and um, also what's a little bit on what my research um, idea or what I plan to research about. And so I think like Okichiku said, the first thing, the most important thing is go to the school's website, read very well what they expect from you. It's not everybody that wants you to submit a three page research proposal. So know exactly what they want you to do. Another thing is if, for example, you've gotten somebody's um, research proposal just to know how to structure your stuff or how to write to your statement of intent. It's very important that you don't go and photocopy what the person has given you because I'm sorry to say it, but I've, seen, I've read a couple of people's stuff where I can pick out words from mine that is in your own stuff. And this is not Nigeria where you, you things are not, um, they have these documents, they might take, they are able to look at it and check for plagiarism and all. So if somebody gives you, somebody trusts you enough to give you their stuff. Do not go and photocopy or bring exactly what the person has given you and maybe just change a few things, change the title, change the location and just submit it. I don't think it's right to do such um, something like that. And um, another thing I remember in my own statement of intent was also um, listing the name of lecturers that professors that I was going to work with. So I knew that I was going to, um, I was pushing, a, um, I was going to research on African legal, Nigerian legal history. And so I went through the website found the name of a professor that majored in African history. I also went through the website, saw a professor that majored, um, that lectured on legal history. And so when I was writing, it was, I just put their names there just to say, oh, I've read about this person, I've read about this person, and I feel that these people are good enough or I trust them enough to um, supervise me during my research. So I think the most important thing is from scratch, go and Go to the website, understand what they, um, they want you to do before submitting or before applying to a university. Uh, thank you very much, Yolanda. And that's a plagiarism issue. I mean, that's also another important thing to look at, even when you're drafting your research uh, proposal, because uh, I mean, these proposals are reviewed by members of the academic committee who are mostly professors. If they find any incident of plagiarism in your research proposal, I mean, they, you would, that would be like a kind of, that would turn them off, that you hardly have anybody who wants to take risk, you know, admitting a student that has already shown potential for uh, plagiarism in their research proposal. So it's important thing to reach out to others to get sample of their research proposal, but don't just kind of copy it and then paste. Use it as an idea to develop your own idea or to build your own idea. And uh, uh, for that, so that also, it's important to 
when you're looking at potential area research areas, look for areas or topics you are, you are very passionate about, not just something you want to write because, oh, I just have to draft a research proposal because this is something you're going to be spending four years working on. And I must tell you, there is the downside of PhD program. There is that time whereby you feel like quitting. The idea is no longer coming out. The only thing that can sustain you at that point in time is the enthusiasm, the motivation you have on the topic you're working on. So it's important to research areas that you are very passionate about. That passion will be your it will be a motivation that will sustain you throughout the period of your study. And also, it helps to look at novel topics because the idea of PhD is originality, making contribution to academic advancement. So look at a topic that is kind of novel, not much has been written about it, or something that is out there that is being debated. There's chances that that topic will be appealing because when somebody goes through it and see, oh, these students want to research on a topic that is, you know, not much has been said. Okay, that kind of gives the person the impression that there'll be some room for originality or something new coming out of uh, this uh, research. And um, then also look for supervisors in your area of research read what they have written in that area, try to understand their work and see what you can add to uh, you know, what they have already. So these are just some uh, important points to look at. Now let's go to the next point. And um, Chino, maybe I'll come to you on this one. Finding and contacting potential supervisors. In some cases, to be admitted for a PhD program, it's you are required to have uh, or identify prospective supervisors. So that means you may need that to, you know, contact prospective supervisors. And this is important. What are some of the do's and don'ts that you think uh, prospective applicants should be aware or should note when they are reaching out for uh, to contact prospective supervisors? Yeah. So your supervisor is a big part, is a crucial element for your grad program. So the success of your, of your grad studies hinges so much on your supervising, okay? So that part is something that you really want to take some time, some good time to find someone who is worthy. And when I say worthy, because you know, you're going to do a PhD program and like you need someone who is worthy of the time that you'll be investing in that program, right? So the things that I would have for you would be one, of course, as Yolanda mentioned, you go to the website, you identify potential supervisors, let's say you identify maybe five of them, and then you sort of have a, um, a list of, you know, the, you, you have your topmost, maybe first five or yeah, something like that. And then you start contacting them, right? So of course, if you're looking for a supervisor, that person has to be, um, the person's research program has to align with your own research interest. And let's say you've established um, some persons who have similar research as to what you're looking to do. Now, the other side of it is to look into the, um, what is the word? So, um, sort of interpersonal um, skills or interpersonal qualities that the person could have that would help you to establish a good relationship with the person during the program. Because I mean, you could find tons of people with the same research interest, you know, something that you're looking to pursue, but then it now boils down to who can you have an effective relationship with, right? A productive one. And some pointers that I have is one, speak to the person, right? Definitely, you want to talk to them, uh, maybe um, through emails. And yeah, talking about emails, please, not just, like, don't just um, send a blanket, you know, email, one that you have for some other professors, and then you send that same email to, you know, like, don't just send a generic email. You have to tailor your emails to um, the supervisors. It has to include, you know, the research area that you're looking to explore, or also some questions that you're looking to explore in their labs, right? Now, when you have, after that email, let's say um, through the email, you get their, their attention, 
Now you should seek to speak with them through Skype. Some ways, like just place a face on it, right? So sometimes like there's just a way of knowing someone by, you know, seeing them, you know, face to face, right? So when you're, when you're um, trying to pick a supervisor, do not think that they are doing you a favor, which is something that a lot of people, you know, um, misconstrue as. Like people think that, oh, you know, they are helping you to leave Nigeria. Oh, they don't care. Okay, you can remain in the, like whatever country that you are, like they don't care at all. So they are taking you because of your skills. They're taking you because you're good. So you have to sell yourself, right? Be like you're good. You have to let that part of you shine. So when, you're, when, you're, when they're assessing you, also assess them. It's a two way thing. Some people feel like, oh, you know, when they, in fact, I've actually had someone over Skype. I was um, trying to guide her. I was sitting right beside her. And then she was speaking to the potential supervisor and she was always like, ma'am, ma'am, you know? I'm like, girl, this person is not doing <laughs> any favor, okay? In fact, to be honest, like some supervisors would, like that would even be a turn off for them, right? So you have to come off as someone who is, you know what you're doing? They're taking you because you're good. So you have to assess them as well assess, you know, um, you know, just from your conversations, you're able to tell, okay, that this person could be someone that you could work with. Now, the other thing to look at is their productivity. Their research productivity is really important. Um, if you go to their website, you will see the list of publications, for instance, that they have. And then you could also see the, their, um, you know, recent conferences um, or, you know, papers that they presented at conferences, all of those things. Those are markers of their research productivity. Okay, you don't wanna go to a lab where a lab that is just not productive. You don't wanna go there, okay? It's gonna be detrimental to your own research program. It's gonna be detrimental to your own career. So you want a lab where, you know, things are going and there is productivity going on there. And if you look at, let's say the last publication, maybe it's like five years ago or four years ago, that was, you know, the last time that they published. I would say, hmm, it's a red flag, if you ask me. It is a red flag. And knowing some supervisors that I've, you know, sort of interacted with, I can tell you for sure that is a red flag. So you don't need someone, like you want to go there and excel. You don't need someone who is going to, you know, sort of make you, um, like, you know, someone who would um, discourage that, that spirit or like that excellence that's in you, right? So that's something to definitely look at. Now, if it's possible in a way, if it's possible to speak to um, maybe some persons who have been to the lab, you know, you can check out their website and see the past students or even the current students. Sometimes you might find even, you know, a black person there and you could establish contact, contact with the person and then you could get an idea of who the person, like, you know, of, um, their relationship with their supervisors, right? Because trust me, like even when like students talk, they talk, they talk. Like even when I was choosing, like I was in here in Canada, I was choosing my PhD supervisor, I connected with the students. And even she was even so open, oh yeah, talk to my students and all of that. And when you speak to them, you may not be so direct, oh, how is this person? But like from your conversation with them, and you could also ask some questions that could lead them to sort of open up. And then they would just, tell you, students would always tell you I their experience. The chat now, and I just noticed that the questions have wiped out from the chat. So, oh, sorry. Uh, I think she continued, Chinaya. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so. Sorry, uh, Chinaya. Yeah. I was. <laughs> okay. We're trying to solve some technical mysteries here. Yeah. Oh, really? That's fine. We, I think we are fine now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so I was saying that um, a crucial part of it is, you know, like I said, their, their research productivity, you have to know if that lab is a productive lab. Then you, you, like, you could also find out from their um, current or past students, you know, to gauge where they are in terms of, you know, their relationship. And then also you could ask some questions um, directly to the supervisor or the potential supervisor as to how they support their students' professional or career development. Ask that question directly. In fact, they are going to see you in a very smart way. Like when you ask questions like that, I remember um, 
asking such questions, you know, to my supervisor and she was so much impressed. And I know some other persons who, you know, conversed with their potential supervisors in that way. And, you know, that sort of sets you guys off on the right foot. Okay. So to, to summarize, um, when you have established that, you know, someone is, you know, a potential supervisor, you like their research, you like all of those aspects. Now, the other side of it, the interpersonal relationship with the person, you have to look into that and that um, in terms of, you know, checking, also checking their commitment to professional development of their students and also their um, research productivity if you're going to be productive in that lab. And I tell you, some supervisors, which is really sad, like some persons do not support your professional or your career development. All they want, all they know is pump out papers, like you're in, like, you know, you're, you're, you're um, executing a particular project. They just want that project to be done, right? They are just supervisors, they're not mentors. Like, 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 you know, especially PhD supervisors, they have to infuse that mentorship aspect in their roles. So and a lot of supervisors are not mentors. They are just, you know, supervising, but not mentors. So you really want to find a supervisor and a mentor together in one person. Okay, and from your interactions with them, you would get to know. Prof, you're mute. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You can hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chinonye, for those very important points. I mean, that's a lot of uh, points you have outlined, I mean, out highlighted there. And the good part of this webinar is that um, the video recording from this webinar is going to be uploaded in our YouTube, ch uh, our YouTube channel. So we'll be sending out the link to the YouTube channel for you to, if you want to go back and watch it all over again, uh, you'll be getting a link after this webinar. So we've had a lot of questions on the chat box. So um, let's see how much of uh, this question we're able to uh, take. Um, uh, Marion, do you are you able to assess the questions now? Yes, but I, okay. I I need you to unmute me, please. I've just done that. Okay, okay, fantastic. So yes, I I have access to the questions now, and in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go straight to them. Um, so the first question here is, hi, this, this is a question from Samuel. Hi, can one transition from a BSc here in Nigeria to a PhD in Canada? Well, I, I think that question has been um, answered, yes. So I'm just gonna move on to the next uh, question. And this question is from Edo. Um, my question is, what do you guys think about progression? In this case, will the fact that one is old and has a master's degree a long time ago affect your possibility of gaining an admission into a PhD program in Canada? If it doesn't, does it not affect such candidates' chances of obtaining a study permit? Okay, uh, let, let me take that. In terms of uh, age, well, uh, let's be honest. Uh, Canada has a human rights regime that prohibits discrimination on the basis of age. So a school will not refuse you admission because you are too old or you are too young. So age is no barrier. What the admission committee will be looking at here is your research experience. So even if you are 100 and you left school 50 years ago, but you have shown that during this period you have research skills that can be able to sustain a PhD program, you shouldn't have a problem being able to being, uh, getting admitted for a PhD program. Then in terms of the study permit aspect of it, of course, uh, uh, that's another aspect uh, we'll be going, we're going to be looking at in a, a different webinar, which discusses uh, immigration aspects of uh, this process. That is the study permit aspect. We'll be having another uh, webinar. Uh, our webinars on um, immigration aspects, will start that in January. For now, we'll basically be looking at admission process. So, um, in terms of uh, being able to obtain a study permit, even if you have been out of school for a long time, but you have been working in a research environment, that should be able to show research progression. I mean, I don't think that should be a problem enabling you to get a study permit. Okay. So that answers our question. Do we have another one? 
I just want to mention that even if you have left school and you're coming, you have left school for a while and maybe had a job, um, it would be also wise if you can show how your work experience can also impact on your research. Yeah. I think yeah, just show that connection, just tie the strings of connection. I think that would um, help you in your application process too. Oh, very good point. Mariman, do you have another Thank question? Thank you. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to move on to the next question now. This question is from Emmanuel. So he says, it's been a great deal to get a potential supervisor in Canada. I hold a bachelor's from AAUA and a master's with a distinction from Unilag, both in biochemistry. I'm open to either MSc and PhD opportunities in Canada. I don't know that this is a question, but I think what this person is trying to ask is how to get potential supervisors. And I think that question has been answered extensively. Yes, so to get potential supervisors, uh, first of all, identify schools uh, as well as uh, supervisors working in your proposed area of research, then um, try to contact such supervisors. And uh, if you can reference back to the point um, that has been mentioned about tips for contacting uh, potential supervisors, I think that will also go, uh, that will be very useful. Uh, I, you know, I mean, discuss that I, extensively. Yes, okay. I want to say that you can, you should also include your transcripts. You can include your transcript and your resume. That just buttresses the fact that, okay, you know what you're doing, you're good enough. And I think when professors go through stuff like that, it shows that um, this person would also be a very good, um, has a, a potential to carry out research. Good point. Thank you, Yolanda. I was um, gonna add, um, sorry. I was gonna say something in that regard. So if Emmanuel, if you're having um, a problem finding a supervisor, something that I've found common with people who are looking for supervisors, you know, people who haven't, um, like, you know, people who have been having challenges with that is the email, the letters that you send to the supervisor, that's sort of their, you know, where they stumble. So even when you have identified the, the right person from the website based on you know the risk, the person's research program, you have to write a good email to them, okay? Not DMA, DSA. Those things they turn people off. Now the content of your email to them has to be like it's not just I am interested in this, see my resume, see my this, bam, kind of that. Okay. It has to carry some weight. What um, what are you interested in? Just give me you know a snapshot of your research interest. Oh, you're interested in this thing. And then there is something that you know when people do supervisors actually like it impresses them. So when you go to read your supervisor's past publication, okay, if you read their publications, you can gain a lot of insights into what they do and also into how you can shape your own research proposal, right? So if you read their research, you know, their, let's, like you don't have to read everything that they have on there. The most recent one, let's say two or three, take the time to like, you know, do that due diligence. And then when you're writing them the letter, let's say from those um, publications you read, you are you're actually able to now sort of derive some potential questions that you could explore. And then in your email, you could be like, oh, that you read this, you know, some of these publications, and then you're following up on something like this, you know, so, 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 like, um, you're wondering, is this, is this the way it happens? You're wondering, like, how about if you do this in this way, these are the things that you're looking to investigate in the lab, and then you ask them for um, funding, like, if they have potential funding opportunities, and, you know, of course, attach your resume and all of that. So, like, not just, you know, a blunt email, show that interest, show that you're passionate, about this. I could share um, a winning email to supervisor. Like I have sent this email to like maybe over 20 persons and I'm telling you, they got the supervisor's attention. One touch, one touch. This was um, an email that I used even here, like, you know, when I was already in Canada, when I was applying for PhD programs, like all the supervisors that I, you know, I, 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 I sent um, emails to, I, they all got back to me. I mean, you could say it's because I'm in Canada that sort of facilitates the process, but no, you could also write, you know, um, some blank emails to people even when you're in here. So it's about tailoring that email and then sort of explaining or um, highlighting to them that you actually know what you're doing and you have gone to read about their works, right? So you've put in a lot of thought in this. 
Um, um, sorry, I don't want to flog the issue, but I just wanted to mention something very significant. For my school, I mean, you, you're not really required to meet, contact a supervisor. Um, so you need to find out what the school does. My school would find you a supervisor based on what your research area is. They don't assume that you know a supervisor already. There are tons of people who are in my school who got into the PhD program who didn't know their supervisor before they started. They just did their applications and the school would send the applications to the specific supervisors. This was because it became quite too burdensome. Like professors, professors were getting tons of emails from different people. Um, and so the school changed its system, like apply to the school, the school will search your supervisor. Then there's a specific form they would ask you based on your research, like based on who you've looked at from the, uh, from the school's website, who would you like to supervise you? Option one, option two, option three. I'm just making this point, like find out what the um, procedure is um, before you do that. But I'll just share five quick points. Number one is please keep the email very short and simple. No one likes to read a long email. Go straight to the point. No God bless yous. You know, go straight. My name is this. This is what I want to do. This is what I've seen that you've done. This is what I'm attracted to. Attached is my whatever. Second point is, please know when to take the L. Know when a rejection, like they will not necessarily tell you, no, I'm not interested. But if they ignore you and you send one reminder, please don't keep remind, sending them um, again and again. The third point I'll make is an email is a good opportunity to introduce yourself, but you can be smart. Most professors have seminars, webinars, conferences that they attend. Go and attend those conferences in the Zoom breakout room. Say, hello, my name is this. So that's a more strategic way to get them. You can follow them on social media. That's also very important. Like that, you find other very avenues to uh, get to know who the supervisor is. And sometimes they would, it doesn't mean that when they agree to supervise you, then you've gotten the admission. They can just tell you, if you get it, I'm happy to work with you. And so you can include that in your application process. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank if you. I may just add something or maybe sort of um, um, emphasize on something that you said, Jay. So like some, some schools, you know, you don't have to, to have identified or maybe not, you don't have to have contacted a supervisor, right? Like, you know, they make that selection. They help you to make that selection. But then so for some other schools and some other programs, you have to identify the person. You have to be the one coordinating that aspect. And then in your admission um, application, let's say in your statement of interest, then you have to mention that person. So, but then I would say if the university that you're applying to, you know, has that structure where you don't have to have identified someone or maybe writing emails to them, you know, they can help you kickstart that process. I would still advise you email them. So you have identified, you know that this is person that you want to work with, right? Still email them, establish contact with the person. It's always advisable to establish that contact with them. And then so that when your school now forwards your name to them, they are like, okay, well, this person has contacted me. And then, you know, that sort of, um, like, you, know, you just sort of stand out to them that they have that contact already. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kechiku and uh, Chinonye. Now, um, let me just... Uh, appeal to members of the panel if we can have you guys here for much longer. I know this um, webinar was supposed to end at two, but there are just so much questions here. I don't think it would be really fair for us to abruptly end the panel. I know in this part of the world, time is of essence for everyone. So please, uh, members of the panel, if I could have you guys hang on for a little while longer while we take more questions. Is that okay with everyone? Thank you. So Mariam, please, next question. Yeah, so I'm just gonna move on to the next question real quickly. Um, so this question is from Fisaya. Fisaya says, please let's have the scholarship available so we can apply. I have economics background with 11 years banking experience. Um, I think what this person is asking are, is probably information on available scholarship. I don't okay. know if there's anyone on the panel who would like to take that. On available scholarship, we intend to organize another webinar that will focus specifically on funding. Um, we can't provide much information about uh, funding and scholarship here because, I mean, that's a, a webinar on its own. So, uh, Fisayo, if you could keep in touch with us in social media, uh, when we organize uh, uh, another webinar on funding, I will be very much happy to provide you with detailed information about uh, funding information. Great. Um, so the next question is from Igiri. Igiri says, um, um, pardon me if, I'm, if I got that pronunciation wrong, um, are funding opportunities available in Canada, please? 
please. Oh, this I think this is basically the same question with Fisayo. So please okay. make reference to what uh, Professor Christian had just said earlier. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question from Wurala Debola. Do I have to get a supervisor before being admitted for a master's degree program in Canada? Um, Professor Gideon, <laughs> do you want to just uh, address that? Um, I mean, because well, we had this conversation in the previous webinars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it depends on what program you're going for. In most cases, some schools will want you to get a supervisor in order to be admitted. Some schools are not don't strictly follow that uh, guideline. Some schools just want you to send your application, then they will uh, pass your application around to members of the faculty who will now indicate their interest to supervise you before they admit you. So in most cases, the answer is no, you don't have to get a supervisor for a master's program. But if you are able to identify, contact, and get a supervisor, your chances of getting admitted is much higher because in your application or your statement of purpose or personal statement, you simply say, okay, I've already identified this person and he's agreed to supervise me. So your chances of being admitted is much higher if you get a supervisor. But in some other cases, uh, you don't really have to identify a supervisor. Thank you, Professor. So the next question is from Christopher. Christopher asks if you can transit from permanent residency after a PhD. I think this question has been answered. I think uh, we've made uh, references. Just to make it clear, there's also yeah. a specific stream for PhD students who want to become permanent residents. It's actually faster. They have a specific trajectory for that. So Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so the answer is yes. When you have completed a PhD, they have, uh, first of all, when you complete a program of study in Canada that is above one year, you're automatically entitled to three years work permits. So that allows you to work in Canada for three years. Within that three years, you can apply for permanent residence under any of the available streams. So that's a pretty straightforward. You, yes, you can do that. And once again, we're also going to be having webinars. Our webinars on immigration uh, study visa will commence a webinar on that in January. So also stay, uh, keep in touch if you want more information about uh, this uh, immigration information. But yes, it's possible to advance from a completion of your PhD to permanent residency. Thank you, Professor Christian. Um, so the next question is from a person that is anonymous. So this person asks, do you need to evaluate your LLB or LLM before you can apply for master's or PhD? Uh, Jake, I, will, I mean, okay, I'll let you take that. Yeah, um, in terms of evaluation, I don't understand what the person means. But I would just say that your LLB is what is really weighted. If you're going to do, because if you're going to do a master's in law in Canada, your LLB is what is really weighted. Your law school could be supplementary, but I know my school doesn't really care about what you make from law school. Now, if you're going to do for a PhD, of course, both your LLB and your master's would be weighted in terms of finding out if you if you would be um, a prospective PhD student. Um, but I just to lace that a little bit is that when you look at how they evaluate, different schools have the ways that they look at it, but they look at your academic performance and they look at your transcripts, your grades to tell how you performed in school. If you need to attach a note, people say sometimes the weighting system is different. Most schools are familiar with the weighting system, like the grading system, but you can always attach a note to your transcripts if possible. And someone mentioned on the chat box, what if I don't have the one from my school, but I have a personal copy. My school will let you submit your personal copy whilst they await the official one to come from your school. The second point I'd like to make is aside academics, leadership experience, work experience, skills and interest do matter as well. So, you know, what, what, where have you worked? What skills do you have? Um, how does that complement your academic experience? I wasn't really an A student in school. I didn't make a first class, but I in junior law school. Um, you know, but I was able to showcase very strong leadership experience, especially in my Vanier scholarship, because some the same application documents I used to get into the program is the same application documents I used to apply for scholarship. <laughs> it's just a different, like much more detailed version. So I think you have to analyze where your strengths lie. You might be academically, it, it can be an academic superstar and that works for you. It doesn't mean you shouldn't complement your application with other things. But even though your academics is not like a first class or a super high two one, find ways to complement your academics with very strong reference letters, very impressive CVs, 
or um, to showcase that you have other skill sets or experience that the school or the faculty will benefit from. Thank you. Thank you, Kichuku. So I'm going to move on to the next question now. This question is from Samuel. Um, how do you handle the tuition for an MSc in Canada? Are there also scholarship positions for an MSc? If no, can someone with a budget of 2 million naira process an MSc and visa to Canada? Or do you need to have a specific amount more than my budget to follow through with the process? That's a very specific question. Uh, um, talking about uh, budget, um, under the immigration, uh, well, the policy of uh, Immigration Citizenship and Refugee Canada is that uh, a person applying for study permit must show that they possess sufficient funds to adequately cover their first year of study. Yes. And that includes your tuition living allowances. So this will depend on what institution you're applying to, what is their tuition. There is no uniform tuition for all institutions in Canada. Some are high, some are low. So your budget uh, will depend on how much tuition you're paying. So basically to answer your question, calculate the cost of your tuition for one year and your living expenditure, I mean, sorry, your living expenses for one year. If you have fund to cover that, then that should be, uh, that is what is required under the immigration rule for you to convince the visa officer that you have sufficient fund to cover your studies. Marem, you're muted. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so uh, the next question is from Bimbo. Bimbo says, I have an online MBA in a school in the United States, so I need an on-campus MBA program before the PhD. So do I need an on-campus MBA program for the PhD or can I apply directly? Okay. Um, I could quickly just answer that because I answered it in the chat. So an MBA is a more, more likely a professional development course, not really research intensive. And so if your master's is an MBA, um, most likely, especially an MBA from, on, from an online, I'm not saying online MBA is, is not valued, but sometimes you need to have like a more research oriented master's. Uh, so you might want to consider doing another master's in person and that after that you can do a PhD. Except if within your MBA, maybe your PhD is related to your MBA, which I doubt, but when evaluating So if you do have, maybe you have publications already or other things that supplement your MBA, that's fine. But generally from a legal perspective, master's degrees that are professionally oriented um, need a lot much more than just I have a master's for them to get into the PhD. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, Chuku. So the next question. Um, so this question is direct directed at Chinonye, and this question is from Akinwale. Um, I have gotten my academic records assessed. I have been asked to apply to PhD health program in the Dalhousie University. I've contacted four supervisors, but I have not gotten any feedback for close to two weeks. What would you advise I do? Prof, that's the area now. Your, your people has not replied for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Which is not weird, I right? Mean, two weeks is short. I don't know. People yeah. Are I, yeah, it's it's short. Like, sometimes I don't even get a reply from these people for like three months or something, exactly. right? Yeah. In fact, even I had a friend who got a reply after like seven months, <laughs> you know? So it's like, you know, this professor sort of went back to their, maybe they had a backlog of emails or something like that up until the time that they got to, to her. But I would say um, how many times, like, you know, just like Jake mentioned before, or Kechiku, I think I should be saying Kechiku, that's uh, the name that everyone knows yeah, here. Right. Yeah. So, but um, you have sent, I don't know how many times you've sent your emails to them. So have you sent the first time and then you haven't received the response and have you followed up? And then again, like I said, what is the content of your email? Okay like your email should be, like they might just delete the email because you know because of the content that's potentially um possible and then um so you just have to review the content of the email make sure that it's something that is appealing 
to the person on the other end, and then you could try contacting them a second time. Now, when you say that you've been asked to apply, does that mean that, um, okay, so the program itself, do they require you to have a supervisor before you can apply? Or is, is it that program whereby that you can, you can just apply and then they can help you, you know, um, get a supervisor? So I think that's something else that I would, you know, I would love to know. But if, if you have to find a supervisor yourself, then you could try contacting them again. And then, you know, modifying your email as needed. And then, of course, like spread, uh, spread your, your, your application. It's not just the housing. There are so many other universities out there that you can apply to. And if you do have your academic records um, assessed already at Dalhousie and they find it um, fitting, then I believe it, it, it could be, you know, um, fitting for other programs in other universities. So why don't you explore the other option? It's not only that. Um, I just want to say something. I advise people to send their um, first contact email with the supervisor very early before that short period where you have to submit all your, um, you have to submit your application, um, everything you're using to apply. So I saw somebody right there that seven months is too long. If you stop, if the application process begins in August and you have sent an email to a professor January before August, definitely you would have, a, you might have a reply before you have to submit all your documents. But if you start, if you decide to submit, um, send an email to a professor in August, when the application process begins in August and you have to submit all your documents by the end of December, that short period of time may not be sufficient enough because these professors are in the university, they are teaching, they are busy. Mm -hmm. So you don't expect them to give up what they are doing to um, just send you a reply. They, are all, they also have things that are keeping them occupied. So try to start the process early before your um, your application um, is due before the deadline. And uh, I would so also like to add to that, that um, school is in session now. So most of us are really, really busy. So if you haven't heard back from them in two weeks, I don't think you should give up two weeks. It's really a short time. I mean, I have some emails I can tell you in my mailbox now that has been there for like three weeks. What I simply do, I just kind of highlight them, know that I have to go back to answer them. There are emails that are really priority that they have to be attended. There are certain things that have to be attended immediately. So I would think maybe probably you give them time. If they don't reply, then maybe follow up with another email. But uh, I would also suggest maybe if you can contact Chichin Onye to get the sample email she talked about, see if the problem is whether the professors are too busy or maybe it was the email that you sent them is a the problem. I mean, we can't tell now, but um, yeah, uh, those are options that, I mean, those are things you should bear in mind. Either they are too busy, they will probably get back to it, or maybe you give them some time, then send a reminder. Thank you. Okay. Um, in the absence of any other comments on that question, I'm going to move on to the next question. And the next question is from Mary Nadine. Um, I apologize again if I uh, pronounce that incorrectly. Uh, so this question is specifically directed to Professor Christian. And the question is, please, is this new arrangement of transcript careering to ASI valid for students from other African countries, other countries other African countries than Nigeria? I think she's um, other countries. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Marie Nadine, for the question. So um, this particular um, transcript arrangement, it's for ASI fellows. We have not started our fellowship program. So it's not an arrangement we have for everybody because we don't have the resources to handle everybody's transcript. I mean, all of us working on this project, on this initiative are volunteering our time. So there's limit to what we can do. So that opportunity is open to ASI fellows when we eventually start the ASI fellowship. So if you are selected as an ASI fellow under the fellowship, we'll provide this opportunity to you. And it's open to everybody because AI, AI, ASI will deal with scholars of African descent, not scholars of any particular country. Thank you, Professor. Um, the next question is from Akinwale. Um, and this question is on a research topic. Can one do his or her research in Nigeria while schooling in Canada? Uh, my research interest is around the work I do in Nigeria. I think uh, Yolanda might be in a good position to answer this question. <laughs> Yolanda, that should be your question. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, yes, definitely. Um, my research is on Nigeria, in fact, colonial Nigeria. 
So, and I'm schooling in Canada, I'll have to come back home to Nigeria for um, field work and all. So yes, you can always write about Nigeria even if you get admission to a school, university in Canada. Great, thank like, you, Yolanda. Add a bit to that, just a little bit to that. My master's was also on Nigeria alone, but for my PhD, um, my professor was like, it might be important if you expand a little bit. Um, sometimes your supervisor might not have interest in your local country. But if you're able to tie it to something more international or something that, it, that Canada would be interested in, that could advance it. But nothing stops you from, you know, just focusing on one jurisdiction. But sometimes you might want to think critically, is there a need to expand this? You know, can I be more inclusive? Or can it be something that relates to what my supervisor would work on, even though they're not Nigerian? Thank you. Um, moving on, this question is from Samuel. Please, can I set up the admission process with a personal copy of my university transcript? I think this question has been answered. Does anyone want to answer? Yeah, it's been answered. Yeah, I think this question has been answered. So the, the next question is uh, anonymous. Do you have to be a licensed lawyer in Canada before you can lecture in their universities? Uh, um, Okay, the answer is no, you don't have to be licensed lawyer in order to lecture in the university. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Sandra. Sandra says, if I have converted my transcript to West America, can I have it sent to Canadian schools because of the challenges of applying for transcript here, coupled with schools that are on lockdown? um i don't know uh that's one question i'm not I'm, i i would not be able to answer i don't know if uh, universities would be able to uh, accept waste assessments so you may have to follow up with the particular university you want to apply to to find out if they will um do that or if they will accept that considering the COVID 19 challenges but in most cases the university will want the transcript not um a waste assessment of the transcript. So follow up with your university and find out if they will accept that. Thank you, Professor Christian. Um, the next question is from Beauty. Uh, Beauty says, getting reference letters from some lecturers and professors can be a hassle. Um, any comments on how to make that easy? <laughs> I could <laughs> provide some insights. It is tough, which is why I think Yolanda and Noye made it clear that you have to start very early. If your deadline is in three weeks and you want somebody to write a letter, even for me to write my own personal statement took me like two months, but you want somebody to write you a very strong letter in two weeks, they must really, really love you. Um, so it's always better to start really, 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 really early. And I think that that, that makes a whole lot of difference because sometimes my, my referees from Nigeria, they don't understand that it's a very competitive process. Mm -hmm. When I first applied, my lecturer from university just wrote, he was a great student. He listened very well, give him the admission. I said, ah, is that how they do it? <laughs> when you're applying with like hundreds of people. Um, so my experience have taught me that you need to give your, your referee information that they can use. Even though they taught you, they need to understand that sometimes it's not just their name as doctor, dean, or assistant professor that marks it. If they can cite an experience in class that during land law lecture, she was dedicated to a project She's like explaining a detail or a story of how you are remarkable does help. So contact very early, give them information that they need, send them your recent CV because since you graduated from school, they, would, they don't know what you may have been doing. You know, Let them catch up, let them know even what your research proposal is about so that when they're writing your letter, they can say, I'm very familiar with, she has told me or he has told me that he wants to research on X, Y, Z. I think he's capable, blah, blah, blah. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, it's important that your referees come from both your school uh, but, and also from your work experience as well. And you want to ensure that your referees are not saying the same thing because some schools are asking for three reference letters. If the first one says she's a good, great communicator, second one says she's a great communicator, it, 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 it is repetitive. Let's see how you can help your referees focus on different strengths that you have so that your academic committee can see an array of how people perceive you differently. Your academic referees should focus on how you did well in school, how you turned in your assignment excellently. Some can even say, even though you didn't graduate with two one of first class, these are the ways that you were exceptional. They can even say in a class of 2000 people, you ranked this particular number. 
So your academic referees can focus on that while your professional referees can then say all those beautiful things of how you're a great communicator, team player number one, if not for you, you know, just talk about your personal traits. You come in early, you're dedicated, you're diligent, you speak seven languages, like all those things can come from your, your professional side, right? Um, the last point I will make is, because I mean, I've, I've, the reason why I'm so passionate about this is so many people have disappointed me in this life in terms of reference letters, but I've learned how to go around it. Sometimes the name of your, um, your referee carries a lot of weight, but the name is not enough. Because I remember one time my registrar of the school wanted to write me a reference letter, but it was like half a paragraph because he didn't have time. Um, sometimes it might not be somebody popular. I remember my most persuasive reference letter came from a junior lecturer who was not even a professor in university, but he was the coordinator of my law clinic in school. And the way he wrote, it was almost like a love letter saying, this boy, this is how he has struggled. These are the ways that he used his skills in the law school. He was not a professor, but that letter was, I found it so treasurable and it really did help me compared to that registrar who just wrote, he was a great student, give him admission. So you might, you might want to think in the minds of your academic committee, you not being yourself, will you give yourself admission based on your reference letter? Um, so go early, tell them what your research is on, give them the resources they need for them to make that letter. Keep reminding them, keep reminding them. Sometimes, I don't know if this is allowed, but you might want to incentivize them by saying, can I come and meet you where you are? Is there anything I can, so that you can help me produce letter quick, quick, fast, fast, you know? Um, those things can actually help, you know, letting them know it means a lot to you. And if they send you a very, I know sometimes you can't see the reference letters they send. So you might want to say, sir, do you mind sharing with me? Let me know before you go and send something that will just go back or scatter my application process. Like you might want to know what they are writing about you. Some schools don't let you see, but if you're not telling them how you want them to represent you, at least you want to have an idea of what they're sending on your behalf. Sorry, I'm speaking too much about this. Like I said, I've, I've been disappointed in the past. <laughs> no, that, that's a very good point, Jake. And another thing I also want to, uh, want to add here is sometimes to make it easier for them, why don't you draft your own letter of reference and then send it to them? Because you know certain skills you have, they may not necessarily know. So draft the letter of reference, send it to them and let them use it as a kind of starting point. Whatever they want to add or take away, then they can do. That makes it much easier for them that, you know, for them to kind of start thinking of what to, you know, the, prob the, the time of having to put these things down and how much time it's going to take on them. So make the work easier for them. Draft a reference letter, what you think is the kind of reference letter you're looking for. Send it to them and say, okay, this is draft. Why don't you add or take anything you want to? And then maybe prepare the final and send to them. So that will also help. Okay, if I may add to that, um, um, like so there's a caveat there as well. So don't overblow yourself because I've seen when people, you know, write their own, like personally, I don't like writing my own reference letters. Like even when I'm asking for references and then people are like, oh, write it. And I'm like, gosh, <laughs> you know? So you don't want to overblow yourself because I read recently, um, you know, someone who, who is applying for Vani scholarship and then, oh my goodness, the letter was just so, ha, I'm like, it's a lot of exaggerations here, right? You could actually see that this was the word this came for themselves, right? So do not exaggerate yourself. So, but in that case, you could work with the person, like everything has been summarized here, like work with them, you know, side by side, what do they need? Do they need you to write this letter? Or some persons just prefer to write and then you could make some you know, modifications to the letter. Now, everything has been covered, like, um, okay, Chukwu covered everything that we needed, like the CV and all of that, but there is something else that I want to point out. If you're applying for a PhD and then you already have a master's, right? It's skeptical or like it raises, like it's a red flag when you don't get a reference letter from your master's supervisor. That is something that I see a lot of people do. So some persons say like, oh no, my master's supervisor is this on that one. It's, they can't get the letter from them. If you're applying, if I wear your, like if I'm assessing your application, it's gonna raise a big like shining red flag because you didn't get a, a reference letter from your supervisor. What does that mean? It's possible that you were not good. It's possible that you, you, know, you can build a relationship, a working relationship with you know, um, someone or let's say in the lab. So always, always get a reference letter from your supervisor. I mean, except if they are late, you know, they passed, 
or if there are you know some other things or some other reasons as to why they cannot provide you such letters then you know you have to um include that maybe in your application or something like that let me okay. just make one sorry quick prof quickly sure. um people need to be aware that it's not normal for your um referee to say send me a draft and i would it's actually not uh -huh. not, not normal so what Noya is talking about people just giving such garden like rainbow kind of uh uh com the, the admissions committee can tell when a letter is not coming from the supervisor themselves so what you can sometimes do is ask another person to write it write a draft you know you can then the person can submit that draft to your supervisor or you can provide your supervisor with like paragraphs of what you've done or things that you think are strong let them now do the writing the thing is there is a way sometimes i mean even looking at some applications, you can tell that it's the same person that wrote two or three different letters because mm -hmm. the language is the same. Like people can tell these things, people can okay. see this. So you might want to guide them, let them do the writing, let them do the draft, right? And be very wary of things that do not add value for the reference. Saying such a, this was the re most remarkable person. This is the best, um, such a great person. So those things don't add anything to your you know, reference. Don't say, you, I, always, I always tell, like, if you're, someone's going to reference you, don't, they should not say how amazing you are. They should show how amazing you are. Mm -hmm. And examples can help get that point. When he led this project that nobody did, this is what they achieved by their contribution. When they asked questions in class, these were the ways that they were thinking. This person went over and beyond. I remember a paper that she wrote. I remember an assignment that he or she did. They said X, Y, Z. This person was able to think critically about this issue where no students could think about it. That already shows that you are the best amongst your peers, right? You don't have to say, this is the best amongst this, if no one else, such a remarkable, some people even say, great, profound, remarkable, dedicated, demanded. you know, it, it doesn't add any value because you're, you're just saying it, but they are not showing it, mm -hmm. right? So I find, the reason why I'm making this emphasis is because when I got my Vanier scholarship, which is like the most prestigious scholarship, very competitive, Vani will give you a score. They will tell you academic, this is what you scored. Um, research interest, this is what you scored. My leadership potential, I got nine over nine. And to get nine over nine for your leadership potential means that they looked at your references and they looked at your CV. Mm -hmm. And I knew what my reference letters were. My references were like, okay, this guy did not make first class and you know, he might be like this, but they really portrayed how really, really good I am and how deserving I am of the scholarship. And it's the same reference that I've used for all my scholarship applications. Maybe that's why I'm too passionate about it. So it's, a reference can make or mar you. But these yeah. tips, I'm sure they're very, very helpful. So thanks, bro. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jake. Thanks for, to every member of the panel. So we seems to be running seriously out of time. So Mariam, why don't we just take one more question? So are you saying the last question? Yeah, last question, please, because okay. uh, time is Maybe you can go through and see if there are some other ones that are unique. You know, yes. I also try to answer some of the questions on the chat so that people okay. actually get responses. So most of them have actually been answered. Okay. Okay, perfect. So um, yeah, so most of them, yeah. So all the questions I'm seeing here are on reference letters and a couple have been answered. Um, all saying. have been answered actually. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Chinonye. Yolanda and Okechuku, Mariam also for, you know, um, for your participation uh, in this webinar. Thank you very much for your time. And I also, I would like to thank the participants who joined us from different parts of the world. Uh, you know, Canada is indeed a great place. And um, those of us who have been here, we have seen that. And um, that's why we are trying to extend this opportunity to, to I mean, to those of you out there, and um, ASI will continue to organize webinars to provide information to uh, bright scholars who are interested in pursuing further education in Canada here. So like I outlined in uh, earlier webinar from now till December, we'll be organizing webinars that focus on uh, the admission process to graduate studies in Canada. From January, we'll start another webinar that focuses on the immigration aspect of uh, uh, your journey to Canada, which has to do with application for study permits and other information. And then after that, when uh, subsequently in the spring, we'll now look at uh, other topics like, you know, 
uh, coming to Canada, settling down and starting your studies. So uh, these are ways of disseminating information that will help you to uh, make your decision and also to successfully carry on with that decision to, uh, to come to Canada to pursue uh, um, further education. So wherever you are joining us from, uh, thank you very much for making time to attend our webinar. Thanks to my panel uh, for the time uh, you volunteered to provide this information to the participant. So at the end of this uh, webinar, I'll be, uh, maybe I'll be sending out a link to the YouTube channel where you can watch this um, uh, um, uh, the video of uh, this webinar. And I also encourage you to uh, follow us in social media. Uh, we're in Facebook, we're in LinkedIn, and Twitter and Instagram, where we normally provide up to date information about um, future uh, webinars we'll be organizing. So thank you so much for your time, and I hope to see you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All the best. All the best. Thank <laughs> you.